disgusting. Take it yeah. off? No lady that begged me to take it off. I wanted your flavor, your flavor. Yeah. <laughs> my, my father said my name is well, you know what they do when they get home? So, David Greco took out the subdued. <laughs> <laughs> no glove, no glove. Thank you, George. David Greco took out the subdued. We're wrong? All right, oh, so wow. we're looking here. And they're like, all right. Well, not really. You don't even got to look anywhere. If you, need, if you need to make a statement, that's the camera. You, <laughs> motherfucker. I look at you. I got to be the job. <laughs> Here. I'm here. Mike's Deli, Arthur Avenue. I think this is only the second time we brought this show on the road. But I'm really happy you guys made it. I really I'm, am. I'm glad you got, you're having it. You're sacrificing Buddy, a couple I, hours of business to have this right now. to have you guys here is a lot of fun. You know how many people, first of all, uh, do you know those guys? I'm like, of course we know those guys. But they love that you were in New Orleans with us. And like John said, this is a, a great thing and he's super excited. I'm happy for you guys. It's going to be great. Well, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for John. That goes without saying. Because our first, uh, one of our first business meetings were here. Yeah. And we hit it off and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to New Orleans. I love business <laughs> meetings here. That was a great trip. Yeah, it was, was a, a great, great trip. trip. I gotta be honest, this morning I didn't have breakfast because I'm like, I'm going there and <laughs> I need every ounce of space. You, I'll let you pick and get through it, don't worry. This is a man who feeds you no matter what you do. I've never seen him come without food pre-prepared. I mean. I mean, he shipped food to New Orleans. <laughs> That was our dinner set. In other words, you could eat muffalata that was frozen <laughs> three days old, <laughs> three weeks old. No, it's, what's funny is we sit, so the first day, David has a tradition. I want, actually want to talk about it a little bit, but um, the 500 pounds of pasta. Let's start about that, because it's way over 500 pounds. Oh, okay. By the time all the gravy goes So why, on, are we, why are we promoting 500 pounds? Uh, what we said, it's, it's no less than 500, but by the time that 140 gallons of gravy goes on, by the time the pasta absorbs the water, it's like, I, I, I calculated last time that it's like seven, 800 pounds. We say 650. The problem is we don't have a scale there, Yeah. but it's way over 500 pounds. It's the biggest bowl I've ever seen. Yeah. The bowl's amazing, 10 it, foot by 10 Can you 10 take foot. the people through the process? If they didn't see the video. So what it is, in New Orleans, New Orleans is known to have the largest group of Sicilian Italian Americans in the country. And they say that it came from the late 1800s, 1900s, earlier. They were sending lemons from Italy, and the lemons were landing at the port, and on the lemon boxes, they had to return them. They would put messages to tell the paisans to come to work, that there's work in America, and guys would jump On the lemons? On the lemon crates that were being returned. So say, viene fatta. Viene laborata. Or viene top. Anyhow, top. there are a lot of Sicilians down there. I like to joke that they sound like Yosemite Sam <laughs> Sicilian. That accents are the best. Yeah. Oh, yeah, accents good. You know, we say look at that cool. They say look at that ghoul. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm six percent Italian. <laughs> I heard but that. that <laughs> but the year after Katrina, and the reason I'm there is because of Michael Badalucco, uh, the Emmy actor, Award Michael. winner. Uh, he's from Brooklyn. He swears. You know, his father's Joseph. He's Sicilian, and he really has a lot of passion for his heritage and culture. Michael was invited the year after Katrina. They didn't think they were going to do the parade. And Michael and I went down and they were serving. Um, Michael asked me to help them in the kitchen because he knew they had this big bowl of pasta they served. And it was 200 pounds of pasta that tasted like ketchup and the meatball was, I couldn't eat it, but let's put it that way. And the judge, who's a real character, and I'm glad you guys got to meet him, he, uh, he's like, don't worry, we spoke to the, we spoke to the Pope. <laughs> My baby. You could, you, could eat, you could eat meat. It was during Lent on a Friday. I said, what is this? They, they, they emailed the Pope and everything was okay? He said, well, they, he wasn't emailing. He said he was calling. <laughs> no. Fast forward. The judge. I said to the judge, I know that the Sicilians live by il mano el mano, which I love that saying. The hand is the hand. I said, next year, I promise you, I'll bring you the celebrity and I'll make the pasta. And I brought Vinnie Pastori, a.k.a. Big Pussy from The Sopranos, yeah. who was a huge hit in New Orleans because he can't walk through the streets without anybody screaming, Hey, Big Pussy! And they loved him. And we made the pasta. I did everything at my 
expense and also at my the way I do things. Mm -hmm. So the Hilton was pretty impressed. And fast forward now, it's 16 years later, I'm still doing it. Yeah, because uh, Friday morning, that's when we started making the pasta. Well, we got home Friday morning from going out. <laughs> yeah. At like four, and then you you pulled the all nighter. I, 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 I had to go straight to work. I had to go straight to work. And then like me, I was the first one. Then the video guys came second. And I'm just like, wow, this is really happening right now. It was happening. It was a lot of fun, too. And I wouldn't let John clean the anchovies this time because I got the anchovies promoted. and got sardines. I'm so happy. <laughs> the ruins your shirt that Opening day. those anchovies is the worst job in Italian America. Humble beginnings. Listen, the kids worked hard with me. I'm not going to deny I send his mother and father a photo at 7 a.m. of him breaking his ass, as we say. <laughs> yeah. John is the most humble guy I know. I mean, if you ask me to open sardines, I'm not a fish guy. I'll be like, <laughs> listen. I get it. I, I, I can't do it. John, how did you get involved in New Orleans? This guy, I was at NIAF. I was the president of NIAF. We've known each other. I came to Fordham University here, so. Before he went to Fordham, he was he was still in high school, scoping out yeah. the neighborhood, and he was like, this is good for me. Yeah. <laughs> he I, felt so comfortable. I basically came to Fordham because it was on Arthur Avenue. And uh, so we became friends, and we started working together at NIAF. Dave was the first guy to really uh, throw in and help me plan this big expo that we built. Icing on the cake when he asked me to make 500 spleen sandwiches in Naya. <laughs> spleen? The steak yeah, for still. S Sicilian. It was the like Sicilian. Oh, right? like uh, uh, Fushted. Oh, yeah. The, the, yeah, the oh, cook. Oh, man. It, was, it smelled like the toilets Who backed up that? in the hotel. Who, who eats that? Well, I'll still. tell you what's interesting. So, as I made it, I stunk up the neighborhood that I made so much. It was rough. I drive to Washington with it. Now you have to reheat it. And the thing is, reheat it, it does taste better, but the aroma was out of control. Double the strength. And now he had a huge Sicilian event going on in Washington, and these men were going crazy. Yeah. They were just smelling it. Si tu manjuguel, altra cosa tu manjuguel. I really thought the toilets backed up that morning. I, I was, we had like three, 4,000 people coming. We had 300 vendors. and. But I, I met him through NIAF, and he kept saying, you got to come to New Orleans, you got to come to New Orleans. Finally, I went down, and that was it. I was hooked. A lot of people have been messaging us about, like, how they could get involved. Like, that you just want a piece of the action. Well, listen, it's the St. Joseph Society Club now. They changed the name because John also helped them down there. John's uh -huh. been also sending donations. And anybody wants to send a donation to them, they really need it. Yeah. The Sicilians down there are a little different than the Sicilians up here. What's the best bit. way to make a donation? Like, it's, it's, this, uh, it's the... It's the Italian American St. Joseph Society now. They have a great website. Uh, you can donate. You can become a member. And the truth of the matter is, what you really can do is come down for the feast. You know, come down on the weekend. Next year will be the weekend closest to St. Joseph's Day. This year we were a week after because got to trade with the Irish yeah. every year for the St. Patrick's Day. But, yeah, come down, you know, uh, buy tickets to stuff. And definitely if you want to send a donation, every little bit helps. It's a big undertaking. It's, yeah. no, it's no small thing. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm very impressed how the same families for it's 53 years now. The same families are still doing it, yeah. and the judge's nephew and the judge's the the judge's partner, Mr. Cortillo, who passed away, his sons are doing it, and their family. and And there's a lot more behind the scenes that people don't realize because they don't do it like a parade in New York where it's all business. This is really family, yeah. and that's where I fell in love with it. For me, now I have Sicilian extended family, which I never had. I kind of admire the fact that, you know, we have so much Italian stuff around. Like, look, we have Arthur Avenue. We have Little Italy. We have, like, so many enclaves in Brooklyn. In New Orleans, I got, like, when we're driving around, like, I didn't feel any Italianness at all. But then here you are, you have a parade that's... That parade was amazing. It was amazing. A hundred thousands of people. Yeah. That is better amazing. than any parade in, I think, anywhere in America. I've never Such been to a, a parade feeling. like that. And how organized were they? I felt like the streets are usually... When we drive through the streets, they're right on us. Yeah. yeah. It was nice that they put the barrier up, yeah. and I felt like so it was a little less hands-on. Unfortunately, you didn't get attacked like usually. John gets attacked. Yeah. He's the pretty boy of the bunch. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> maybe and, maybe ten years ago. And the issue is that, that they had barriers, so it really flowed. It flowed, and it was yeah. amazing. I was the barriers. Yeah, the barriers helped. When when you guys are giving us the heads up of what's going on down on this parade. I was like, ah, oh, these guys are just hyping it up. Yeah, yeah. There's no way it's going to be like that. Yeah. that. That felt like what Mardi Gras should be in, yeah. in Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. Like, so every it's a time Mardi Gras. Time every Mardi celebrity Gras. we ever had, whether it was Michael Badaluka, Vinny Pastore, we had Chaz. Chaz canceled on them twice. And in New Orleans, 
they're very sour. Your boy in the Bronx, they were very upset. But when Chaz finally showed up, oh, not only great. is he a great actor, not only is he a great he's family a showman, man, too. he's a showman, but they, he's really Sicilian passionate. Yeah. So they loved him, but he had one of the best times. And he's dying. We both say we're going to bring our boys back one day because his son is busy, my son is busy. My, son, my kids have been there, but they were, when they were younger. Chaz and I both teased, we're going to bring our sons now, we'll have a good time with it. Dante would have a blast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We even brought Dominic Chinese. We oh, brought really? Frank Stallone. Frank Stallone had so much fun, and like Sal, got to sing with L Lena Prima and had the best oh, yeah. time. That was so cool. So when you see, like, in New Orleans, it's just like a... I always say Arthur Avenue is a step back in time, but when you're in New Orleans... Yeah, it's a step that's back. A, step that's, back. A st that's another step yeah. back from you this step back. You couldn't write it. Like you said, we, we kind of prepared you, but you couldn't write what we yeah. were going to do. And well said. One thing I do want to say is uh, me and John kind of got, like, an inside joke. Because like I hate dressing up, so like before we take a trip, we'll yeah, be like, a tuxedo. how many how many collared shirts do I need? So he goes, actually, you need a tuxedo if you want to be on the float. He was wearing so I'm thinking, wearing the wrong color. I think. Oh yeah, he stood out. I was wearing. Yeah, I definitely stood no, out. You look good though. I was you wearing look the good. blue tux. So the whole time I'm like, all right, I brought this tux, but I had no intentions on bringing it. Then you told me, no, wear the tux, so you can't get on the float. I thank God the whole time I wore the tux because. Imagine like marching and stopping for like 20 minutes. It like, kills you. It kills you. It's, it's a, it's a it's big exhausting. route too, yeah. Bataluco a couple of times has walked it. I think he's walked off the scotch. That's why he had to walk it. <laughs> yeah. It's like so nothing you've ever been a part of, really. It's it's exciting. I, and again, the thought of them, how they've kept it going for 53 years. Yeah. And I feel like John and I, there's a few people that brought us down that there's a Sal for Carrie. You guys met. I call him Uncle Sal. You guys, on the day of the pasta, Jack Van came. These are men that are, we, we didn't do it this year, but usually Jack Van does a crawfish bowl for us, which is amazing. We didn't do it. If we go next year, I'm going to make him do it. Because for me, it's like really being in the heart and soul in New Orleans. You yeah. see how the people eat. You go to his garage, he puts newspaper all over the table, and you eat the best fish you're ever going to eat. You know, you made a point, like, we have the Little East here, and New Orleans doesn't. But when you scratch the surface, so much of those built like those buildings in the French Quarter, they used to call it Little Palermo. It's yeah. all owned by these Sicilian families. Yeah. It's almost like the Italians who went to Argentina and Brazil, yeah, yeah. because they were Catholic places, because the culture was Latin, they kept their culture, but they integrated so much easier than we did here, where we were like basically put into ghettos and you know stood to ourselves. I gotta be honest too. Me, Rocco, our, our fathers own a deli. You own a deli. I was very impressed with the mufalada. Cause I did not expect it. They're saying, "Oh, mufalada." I'm like, "What mufalada?" Yeah. Then we're sitting down and eating, and we're gonna go to Central Grocery. Yeah, Central Grocery. Called? And it was closed. Yeah. But then we go to Frank's next door. Frank's is our friend. Frank's and good people. Yeah. They give us like this bun, and it looked like a like a hamburger bun. I'm like, what? This is gonna be <laughs> trash. No, it's tasty. Then I taste it. I was like, "Oh my god!" It's After all the about first bite. it's all about the mufalada filling, mm -hmm. the cauliflower, the olives, it's spicy. What is that salad on top? So it's it's jardinera diced, uh -huh. and then they add a special hot pepper. Olives, it's really tasty. A you lot of olives. Yeah. That's so good. We make good. a muffalada here. We do. Oh, you do? Job. Oh, it's a little thicker. Uh, I, was, I was super impressed. And they actually invented that in New Orleans because we were walking. And they said it was like four bro or six brothers, and one had a hardware store, yeah. one had another. Yeah, well, and one guy owned. One guy married the bakery daughter, and she was from the muffalada family. So it was muffalada bread. I didn't know that till we were there. Yeah, shout out to Charles too. He nah, was Charles he was Marsala. like our tour guide for the for the weekend. He's like he, if Pat's the Wikipedia of Italian America, Charles is the Wikipedia of Italian New Orleans for sure. Oh He's my teaching you stuff Good everywhere people. you go. We can't talk about Italians in New Orleans without saying Louis Prima's name. Yes, there's I nobody feel like when him. I get to the city. I what do you think? That he probably has the most influence on New Orleans Italian culture or Sicilian culture. You would say, right? I think he's the most prominent. Uh, manifestation of it, yeah. For sure. I think, like, if you go down there, people, I mean, people all over the world still listen to his stuff, but I think down there, it's like their their life soundtrack, you know? Yeah. Lena's yeah. mom, Gia, who passed away, has an incredible screenplay written that I was fortunate enough to read. She wanted Chaz to rewrite it. And they was all ready to go. And the story, when you hear the story, Louis talks about how the Italians were treated worse than anybody in the city. And well, what they were through and how he respected, he learned his music, jazz, from the African-American plays. And, and he was really, before Frank Sinatra, he was the first man to play. And his band, no matter what color, they had to stay in the hotel with him. 
and Sinatra picked up on that also, and Sinatra and him had a fight over one thing, over his ex-wife, Keely Smith. Mm-hmm. And how they got back together... These hoes ain't loyal. Rose- no, <laughs> Roosevelt, Roosevelt called oh, the really? wife. They wanted Prima to play in the White House. And that's how Sinatra made friends with him again. You know, I heard... That's stories. a hard thing to forgive. Yeah. His ex-wife, uh-huh. Keely Smith, was his singing partner for a long time. And I got to know her before she died because she was very close to Frank Sinatra's widow, who I got to know. And... Uh, I was at a small thing where she played with the one piano guy and sang. She was like 85. You're good, you're good. And somebody asked her about Frank Sinatra. Like, did you sleep with Frank Sinatra? And she was like, yeah, yeah, I did. And she said, uh, you know, a lot of people thought Frank Sinatra versus Louis Prima. Louis was like a short, squat, hairy Sicilian guy, and Frank was Frank Sinatra. She was like, but nobody compared to Louis Prima. So she basically poo-pooed Frank Sinatra's performance. Louis Prima put it down on her. <laughs> yeah, like, he, left the, he left the memories, yeah. I had the brush hole, I guess. <laughs> no, I gotta, I gotta be honest, man. Um, as I've been doing this much more, I, I've always heard of Louis Prima songs, but I feel he was very underrated because he doesn't even like get mentioned as much as you know Frank Sinatra. But more recently, because of social media, now like all the trendy like Italian uh, they content, use his, they use, they use his, his music. You know what the thing about him is that people don't recognize. He was famous from the 20s through the 70s, and he he always evolved to play whatever the music of the day was. So in the 20s, he was doing jazz to the 30s. Then he took it in swing. Then he was doing, he was inventing the, this like whole new style in Vegas in the 60s. And by the 70s, he was doing disco albums. He just always, he was just a cool guy who always projected a cool, calm, genuine confidence. And he was prolific in the stuff he did. Sing, 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 he wrote. Sunday Kind of Love, he wrote. Angelina Zuma Zuma. All those, him he wrote, the guy's got songwriting credits like you can't believe. I feel he makes the most authentic Italian American music though, because like he uses a lot of Italian words. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the even like the storytelling, yeah. like Angelina. Yeah. You know, like those are I, I think Angelina songs. was his mother. It was. It was, yeah. Yeah. But like he I always say he's like an Italian American folk poet. Because he wrote songs that were about our experience. About the war was over, they're fighting with Italy, and he's he's singing Italian songs. Yeah, it's crazy. In America, and he really encouraged people to jazz it up with an Italian beat. Which is kind of cool. He was way ahead of himself. Yeah, way ahead yeah. of his time. And just the fact that a guy like that, like, came from New Orleans, out of all places, like, it could have easily been, like, Chicago, yeah. New Jersey, New York, Philly. But meanwhile, it's New Orleans, and we don't give it enough credit for being an Italian neighborhood. John, sorry, yeah, David, yeah. can you explain how Italians got to New Orleans? Do you know the history yeah, of that? Yeah, it's like Dave intimated before. So in the 1830s, when Sicily it was still independent and relying a lot on its citrus industry, they were shipping a lot of oranges, lemons, and stuff to New Orleans, and they, these sailors and merchants kind of picked up on the fact that like, this feels like a lot like Sicily, and it's a great place to live. There's a lot of opportunity. So many of them started to stay. And like David said, they kept writing home, saying, like, forget... You know, you, How did they write the- home? Because you guys told us before we started recording. On the, oh, we, oh, we did. They used to write home on the, on the crates. Like, they would bring out the citrus out of crates. They had labels to be returned, right? Thank and they would write on the crate, like, you gotta get over here, the work is good, the weather's good. And so people came from Sicily and relocated. And then when Italy finally unified in the 1860s, and the South really lost a lot of its economics and prestige, they just swamped into the area. But they were coming over to cut sugar in the sugarcane fields. I mean, the, the Sicilian exodus into New Orleans, and then all of that Mississippi Delta Valley was significant, really significant. It's still prominent today. Absolutely. One thing I like about New Orleans, especially in, in the St. Joseph Society, is that there's still a lot of young people involved. How I, about that party on Saturday night? Yeah, oh my God. You know, like tell, they, tell us a little bit about that party. So you what, tell us what, the I, what I think is, is, when I prepare people that, so they used to do a, fri- a Thursday night event, a Friday night event, and the Saturday night event. So you'd be exhausted by the end of it. But Friday, we do that pasta. That's an all-day event. By 2 o'clock, it's over. Usually, you want to rest up. For the parade. The next day, the parade starts. Those guys that are working on the parade, a lot of credit. They're out 6 o'clock in the morning getting the chariots ready, getting this, the quads yeah. ready, getting the 
floats are, I mean, it's a lot of work. They they don't get enough credit for the St. Joseph table they do on the, the altar. Floor. The altar. I, was I, I, got, I got there early and I caught that and I was like, what? Amazing. Amazing. And Beautiful. because we were so busy, guys, we didn't bring you to the churches. Yeah. If you saw the altars in the church, which were the week if before. If Pat O'Boyle heard this, he would flip out. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens, it was the week before because the way it well, fell. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So next year, I'm not, I, if I show you photos, you're not going to believe what these people do. And it's mostly the women of New Orleans that are doing the baking, and they make every item from St. Joseph. It's very cool. But I, I feel like I'm very passionate in my work. I feel like they're passionate about what they do. And that's the thing. A lot of people lose their passion. If they're not getting the paycheck, and it's a big problem. These people are not getting paid to do this event. It's from their passion to show their children. To, they like they want to keep it going. Yeah. And for me, I'm I'm really happy that the judge I met. The judges, again, if he was in New York, I don't know if he's still baking as a judge. <laughs> Down in New Orleans, oh, <laughs> he's tough. He's tough. Yeah. Do we yeah. say? But he's good. He's really good. Yeah. And they all have somebody to look up to because what he created for them. And he had other members that helped him do it. And these guys are there still doing it. And that takes a lot of effort. So you do the pasta, then you do Friday night, there was an event now, they do this parade all day. You don't leave, it takes an hour and a half to get organized to leave. You do the parade route, my friend from Long Island, Mr. Long Island, I break Matt's shop, was exhausted. I go, no, no, we gotta go to the party now. Yeah. What party? One time. One night. <laughs> one time. <laughs> then we sit down. I did one time a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> He said one time was like 15 times. <laughs> Dominic had a ball, though. Here's another yeah, he guy. He's he he American. Father's amazing, right from Italy. He had the best time. Yeah, that was great. And then that party at the end, he said, I'm not leaving. I'm <laughs> dancing. I'm going to hang out. He, he had so He much told fun. us he was leaving 15 times that night. But he's he like, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. <laughs> he wouldn't leave. He wouldn't leave. <laughs> he was meeting him the he last people. He had a good time with you guys. He had a great time with you guys, Dominic. No, we did too. 58 years old, he plays, plays hockey every week. He's, he's all right. Yeah, he told me he just started playing. I'm like, that's a bad time to start playing a sport like that. Yeah, yeah. Just I'm getting destroyed. Uh, another thing I want to just touch on is that uh, I feel like Sicilian New Orleans cuisine, it's not similar but parallel because they eat all this fish down there, catfish. Yeah. yeah. A lot of gator. Sicilians a lot of New gator. York do better. You think so? I, let them get mad at me. They're going to get I'll mad at you. In, I'll meet in New York anytime. I'm sorry. I go there to cook because I like what I eat. <laughs> but that's the thing about it. it. The steakhouse is great, but other than that, do you guys not want labels? No, it doesn't oh, matter. Steakhouse is amazing. Steakhouse is I one of the best I've ever been to. Dave, you know how to order. I got to give it to you. When I like going out anywhere that involves food with you. I'll never Please have to order with Dave. I'm never. a professional <laughs> eater, and I want everybody to have the right experience. Sometimes with people that don't appreciate it. By the second or third meal, like John's friends... They're American. When you're with his friends, <laughs> they don't eat like party, you. Nah, it was, they was... were getting hurt, so we had to stop. <laughs> <laughs> we, put him, we put him on the disabled list. Yeah. The, <laughs> only, list. the only people who were Italian at my bachelor party was him, my brother, my brother-in-law. And him and my brother-in-law shared a room. I think you brought so much time. food. My brother was like, this is great. I ate after I come <laughs> so back to the room. Three or four days later, we were, we were at the Hotel Monteleone on the roof having a... Like a you know, a bunch of guys having a pool party, and I break out antipasto and salmon, yeah. and like, where's that from? from the Bronx. Looking for a place to go out, day during a week, weeknight, looking to impress a girl, looking to have a fun time for a birthday. Qzar is everything you want in some entertainment. You got axe throwing, you got laser tag, you got arcade, you got food, you got drinks, you got everything you want. Check out Qzar and tell them Growing Up Italian sent you. Two cousins started a company named after the hometown they're from in Italy. All their jewelry is made with real gold and vermai, and it is the perfect price point for the perfect gift, especially for Mother's Day. They carry men and women's chains on their website. Make sure to go visit their website, cosenzanyc.com, and use code GUI20 at checkout. Go get your cornicello. My parents told me never show up empty-handed. I brought some olive oil cakes. They got me a birthday cake, but I'd rather have this, and I know who this is from. You know why you'd rather have this? It's only six clean ingredients. That's amazing. And today, if you order, use code ITALIAN15, and you save a little scadol, too. Listen, that's nice, but look at this, how beautiful. Salute and mangi, better. Look at that, how beautiful. Salute. Chin chin. This is a happy birthday. Tell me, I said thank you very much. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Miguel. My mm. olive oil cake. Go get yours today. Delicious. What's funny is we were filmed while we were down there, we were also filming a Get in the Car episode with Sal, the boys of Antonetti. And we went by our friend Charlie's house. 
And we're like, you know what? We need to get like some kind of food in this shot, whatever, whatever. So he's like, oh, I know a great place. We walk in and we all walked right out. Yeah. I was like, it smells like a dumpster. It was like a burger. <laughs> then also, as we're driving around looking, John goes, we just got a text from David. We got Anthony Pass. Yeah. And so I was like, I guess we're going to get Anthony Pass. It's always Anthony Pass coming out of his blood. Uh, the thing is, I feel like you are what you eat. Yeah. I so I'm a prosciutto. I'm a <laughs> salami. I know. I, I'm happy about it. I, I prefer to eat my quality. I don't need a lot. Give me a little of the best, and I'm happy. I, if I got to buy something and not enjoy it, it's just not for me. I know a lot of people, just going to go back to the pasta now. A lot of people, when I, when I came back, they're like, Rock, be honest. That pasta was horrible, right? I'm yeah, like, if you were talking smack, that I'm was like, brown, too. I'm like, no, not at all. It was actually comments. good. I, I'm not digging comments from people. First of all, the paisan in Italy, they don't understand that we are holding tradition here. Maybe we're not born in Italy, but our parents were born in Italy, and we're holding tradition. Yeah. Because they wouldn't do the work that we put into that weekend. Amen. Then I'm not going to toot my horn. But I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, I wouldn't put something out if it wasn't going to taste great. Yeah. And anybody who comes down, and you guys are in the industry, not only do we use the best quality, not only do we put a lot of work and effort into it, and I can make the quick sauce. Like at 9 o'clock we were, having, we were eating it, but it wasn't gravy yet. Mm -hmm. And it's about cooking it down for three or four hours. Tell, okay. us, tell us what's in the sauce besides so, sardines. The true recipe, and the thing is, I'm, my mother's Nabilidan, my father's Calabrese. So I got a hard head. Big heart. I never ate pasta con lisarda until I was 18, 19 years old because we had a woman across the street, Lena. And most Sicilian women are petite. She was a petite, <laughs> big, tough woman, and she used to never want to wait on line. So when I was 14, 15 years old, she used to bring her list and two little chocolate chip rice balls. Uh, I was chubby. She knew how to get me. <laughs> so I'd make Chicho sure. Vinicar. That was so your I, salary? She, that, was, that was my little tip. So she'd bring me these chocolate, and she said, Taracamando, make sure my order's ready. I'm like, yeah. okay. 11 o'clock, she would come back and bring me two rice balls. Now, Nabilidad style, my grandmother, whatever was left in the kitchen, that was in the rice ball because nothing, got, nothing was wasted in the house. So it was never the same. This rice ball was delicious with the meat, the peas. So 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. When I started, and I was older, she couldn't come down the steps. She lived on the fourth floor. So she called me. She'd sh I'd shop for her. She'd throw a basket out the window. With the key? And No, not the key. And I'd put the stuff in. She'd pull it up. She'd make the rice balls. She'd call me later, and she'd send me a couple of rice balls. But in my early 20s, she said, Davide, solo te ce l'hai passione, that you have passion. Come help me. And I was helping her make the rice balls. But when I was going there, she'd have eggplant caponata Sicilian style. She'd have pasta con so I never ate this. So she would tell me how she would do it. And that's where I learned. So now when I go to New Orleans, I, I, after 20 years old, I love the flavor because it's amazing. You go down there and they were serving this meatball and this ketchup, I couldn't eat it. So when I gave my word that I would make it, I knew I had to make it with only the best ingredients, the best quality, and I have to tell you, people that were there last week hugged and kissed me and said, my baby was the best one ever. My baby. 16 years, every year they tell me that. It's Except 2021, we missed it. Yeah. And it's about the way we make it, and it goes in this big, the brazier is bigger than this table. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, that machine's called the brazier. That, That's a brazier. Uh, that, that threw a lot of people off, that alone. Because it doesn't look like you're cooking in a pot. Yeah. yeah. So instead of a saute pan, it's a 120 gallon saute pan. And we make two of them, onions, garlic, fennel, the wild fennel, white raisins, pignoli nuts that we toast first and then add to the gravy, tomatoes, uh, white wine, a little butter, it sweetens the sauce up, a lot of hot pepper. The Sicilians in New Orleans like it's spicier than the Sicilians in New York. <laughs> when you stew that down, the aroma is amazing. I mean, I saw you guys, everybody was... Yeah, yeah, and I yeah, smell yeah. great. And I'm not a big fish guy. I love that now, smell. Now, a satisfaction... In New Orleans, you're at a Hilton. The first year, the men I was working with, they were there 30 years. They didn't want me there. When they started smelling it, Big John was one of the guys I worked yeah. with. The goody, he used to call it the goody. At the bottom of the pan, you had to scrape. That's the best part. It's true. Nice and crispy. Yeah. And it makes the flavor. And if your onions and your garlic don't get the right consistency, it doesn't get the same flavor. And every year, we make the right effort to make it perfect. And I have to tell you, 
I've had great success. I'm very proud of it because when you feed, you saw, we have a photo there. It was all of us at 12.07. At 1.10, the bowl's finished. Yeah. In one hour, 600 pounds of pasta is gone. Bugatini, don't insult my father. <laughs> it, it, it is from true the Czech. When you pick it up, there's a great photo. You can see how nice and yeah, thick yeah. it is. Two two things I want to touch on. So one, the sauce is actually Lena's recipe. That uh, the Sicilian lady. Well, she educated me how to make it. I tweet. It's my okay, okay. My terms, my taste. Because I don't know. You'll see me all morning tasting. Yeah. Because it has to. When you're making that big, when you do a pot for two, five people. It's very easy to control. You're making 150 gallons of sauce or gravy. You have to control it. So the whole four hours I'm cooking, I'm tasting. I, I've done a lot of events and like, you know, thousand person dinners, 3,000 person dinners. It's so hard to cook for that many people. It's, yeah. it, you, you, you always go in with low expectations. But working with him all these years, I mean, by the time I was doing events in DC, he was my consulting chef and he'd be in the kitchen like uh, taskmaster on people because mm -hmm. You got to keep the quality. In D.C., we fed 3,000 people pasta. Yeah. In D.C., one day he did 1,000 sandwiches in boxes, a little night. Like, he always comes up with an idea, I'll make it happen. Yeah. But he keeps the quality high, and, like, the pasta's always al dente. The mudiga breadcrumbs are made by a wonderful a lady woman, in, in New Orleans. Miss Kathy, yeah. who's amazing. Yeah. Every year she makes me those breadcrumbs. And there's a certain snack to those breadcrumbs. If they're not perfect. They're a little sweet, too. Yeah. They have to be. And so then we burn quality it. control. So we had a lot that, of comments. That's what I wanted to ask you. Yes. Why do you guys toast the, so, the breadcrumbs? So we, so we, you saw now, a man that was cooking with us, we taught him how to say scola pasta. Yeah. <laughs> and that pasta was al dente when it came out. And then we were saying it wasn't al dente. It, right now you guys tasted it. The video that people were looking that's at perfect. it. Well, you know, the way he explained it to me made sense because then you ran it through ice water. I chill it down and stop it. Now, I don't pre-cook my pasta, but a lot of restaurants that do, the most important is when you pre-cook pasta, some people leave it in water. No, 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 poo-poo. That goes, the water is being absorbed and the pasta is coming mushada. You need to shock it and then you air dry. That's why we put it on the rack. When it goes on that sheet pan, we have that little bit of oil and it air dries. It's almost like becoming dry pasta again. Now, when we put that gravy on top, it's absorbing that sauce Gravy still sounds crazy to me, it by the way. It is gravy, bro. It's, it's fish. <laughs> and it stews. Schnapp, come on, stop, Bello. Giuseppe. When, when you make meat sauce, when you make, and the thing is, it does this color, and it's not 100% red, because... Are the raisins? It's gravy, because of the, the fish. The protein, the meat protein. So you see, you, so Listen, the comments I'll, I'll come to New Orleans, but I don't know if I can say gravy. <laughs> well, New Orleans, they call mouth. gravy. Gravy, my baby. Yeah. Gravy, gravy, my baby. baby. <laughs> gravy, my baby. Bring on the gravy, baby. <laughs> So now, Mom, when the pasta absorbs the sauce and gravy, that gets the flavor into it. And then we top it with that mudiga, which is the breadcrumb, but then we torch it. Because now, the trick to the Sicilian, they put it usually under a broiler. But when you have 30 trays at 30 pounds each, you can't put them under a broiler. Mm -hmm. So we put it in a rack oven, but now the breadcrumb is already toasted. So we do a procedure a little backwards, but that's the only way we could do it so we could have 600 pounds of pasta, al dente and crispy. There's a method to the madness, guys. Yes, I'll tell yes, you that much. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about Mike's Deli. First of all, how many times do you get called Mike? Because <laughs> I, I catch myself like, Mike, most Mike. Most of my <laughs> life, most of my life. I'm David Greco and I'm here since I'm 12 years old and 46 years have flown by. Uh -huh. Is Mike your dad or? Mike was my dad. Mike was the Mike of Mike's Deli. He was Michele. I'm going to actually invite you guys back on May 8th. Mm -hmm. We're doing a street naming. Mike oh, Greco. Miguel, it's going to be oh, Miguel congratulations. Congrats, Mike man. Greco Way. That's beautiful. Uh, back here on News Avenue because he usually had his car on the curb. Everybody that's knew. A, that's a Mike's Deli entrance right there. Yes. That, when, we were, when we came here, I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to Mike's Deli entrance. It's the back of News Avenue. We're going to call it Mike Greco Way. That's beautiful. And we're going to have a pizza oven out there. It's going to be a free-for-all that day. So I want you guys to come and have a party. Maybe I'll be here. Yeah, well, way to honor. That's that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah it's congratulations. congratulations. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, he deserves it. My father was here from 1947, and when he came to America, great story is my father came to America with his twin brother. His uncle set him up to go work. My mom's parents were originally this butcher shop, but they were outside from 1922. From Naples, they were a butcher on Arthur Avenue, and they were the first butcher in here in 1940. 
But my grandfather, my mother, grandmother didn't like. At that time, there were so many people. There was a hundred merchants. Yeah. And it was a little crazy. So they said, we'll stay outside. And 47, when my father came, he would work Monday through Friday with them in the butcher shop. And on Saturday, my mother had four brothers. They were all on the trucks during the week. So on Saturday, they didn't need them because they were in the store. So he started working in here only on Saturdays. And the owner was called, his name was Dominic. They, they used to call him uh, uh, Don, Don, Dominic. Don Domenico. Yeah. And he loved my father. He used to say, you got to work here full time. He said, Mr. Dominic, you have two sons. He said, oh, they're American. They're not going to take over this place. And then how'd you end up taking over? So my father in the early 60s took over. And at, at, I'm telling you, at 12 years old, I was behind the counter. By 15, 16, legitimately running the place. Because my father's life was very different than mine. His life was only wine, women, and mozzarella. <laughs> and wow. nothing else. My mother threw him out in 72. <laughs> she was very happy, and he was very happy. She's 91, and she still talks about how, she, how much he was, he was mean and bad to her. But he was really a good man at heart. But he really lived for... He, he seen a beautiful woman... Schools, I'd be right back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, for me, at 15, 16 years old, if I was working, he would go do his thing. And he was yeah. very happy, yeah. And oh, I man. made some changes in the business, and I, I did, I always, like I said, I always had a good passion for food. So if I'm, whether I'm eating or feeding people, I treat it the same. That's a lot, a lot of people don't. My dish has got to be special, and I want your dish to be special when you taste too. A lot of people don't get that. Smoke mozzarella. Everybody wants to use the chemical dip and buy it already. I can't. I want to smoke my mozzarella stuff. And when you taste my smoked mozzarella, you can tell. You know, yeah. Anything we cook, anything that comes out of the kitchen, there's got to be passion involved. Otherwise, it's not the same thing. What about people that, like the authentic Italians, like gatekeepers, hmm. where you make something like Italian nachos and Italian sushi? So I'm trying to have fun with that. And the thing is, I still have classic dishes, and... My prosciutto mozzarella sandwich, listen, I have people that come from Italy. They go crazy over the paninis. And I make the joke, you go to Italy, a panino's nine euros, one slice. My sandwich, $15, $16, but when it's done, it's an amazing sandwich. Two people can That's eat lunch it. and dinner. For yeah. the Italians, they say it's lunch and dinner, exactly. Because they'll eat half now and eat the other half later. When I do Italian nachos, it's a potato chip. I finish so it, good. it looks like nachos with so truffle good. oil. Prosciutto, parmigiano, or the sushi. Delicious, too. By you way. know how many so comments good, I got? Oh, it's no fish. I know there's no fish, but it looks like a sushi roll. <laughs> but it's prosciutto, mozzarella, sun-dried yeah, yeah, yeah. peppers, arugula, and it tastes delicious. No, it's sick. I want, it, it gets a lot of comments. I love this place. Like It, it gives I, I me a nice too. taste of a cambani, especially where we're from. A nice macelleria in, in Salerno. It gives me that vibe, and I, I don't goal, have anything like that. We've always said with this market... Some things never change. We try to keep everything the same. Having a neighbor like the butcher that I have, they're amazing. They're considered the best butcher in the neighborhood. Yeah, everybody's working the hard. The fruit vendor, same attitude. We have some new people. They're trying their best, and we hope they succeed. Yeah, you know, when I first came down here, it's 20-something years ago now, when I got to Fordham, and the thing I loved about the neighborhood was it was different than other places, even like our part of Brooklyn or Manhattan, Little Italy. This market in particular still had a guy who was doing pots and pans and sharpening knives. Had a flower guy with seeds, seeds and stuff yeah. from Italy. It had stuff that you just didn't see anywhere else. And even today, still, like, if you really need something, you could find pretty much everything on Arthur Avenue, right? I mean, that's... The thing is this, Arthur Avenue, we're going through changes, but there's also some positive changes because you have Fordham University with 10,000 brilliant students. What I say, and I've been saying this for 30 years... This is the real Little Italy. And I still continue to say it. I love Mulberry Street. I go down. The feast was fun. It was crazy. It's not my scene. But something about Arthur Avenue, it's more genuine. The merchants that are here are here for 100 years. I'm not the only merchant that has family members for 100 years here. Madonna Bakery. Uh, the butchers, each butcher, Biancardi, uh, Pete's, uh, Vincent's. These are butchers that are satisfying a lot of people. There's Terra Nova Bakery. There's a Dale Bakery. These families are here a long time, but they're all family members running it. So that's where it's more genuine. The restaurants here. We have less restaurants, but each restaurant, it's not about fancy food. It's something unique. You have Amelia's where it's a true Sicilian dish. 
You have Dominic where it's completely Calabrese style and it is truly the first family style meal that was going on in New York in the 50s and 60s. Mario's. I know that Regina's a restaurant, but she makes the best pizza in the neighborhood. A pizza oven that only makes pizza is unheard of. Yeah. Rigoletto's. People go there to make their visit. Special place, but you feel like you're somewhere special when you're in Rigoletto's. So the neighborhood has a lot to offer, but the restaurants aren't about chop shop. I'm not saying that that's all over, but in the city all over, it's only about banging people out. You come to Arthur Avenue, you enjoy. There's a few restaurants they bang out, you don't eat there. Yeah. What do you think keeps this neighborhood? Because it's 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 lasted longer it's, than most. It stays strong because of the merchants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These merchants here don't have people in front working for them. They have employees, but they're there every day. The this guys don't have to sing to bring people in. Yeah. Uh, people just know that's where yeah, you gotta go. You gotta go. You're working. You're doing your job. You're like. Me, I take more time than a lot of people because I, I am on, I'm on events. I'm on, like, tomorrow I'm, I'm making food for a TV show. I'm very fortunate. A lot of celebrities, they know if I cut the, the food's going to be good. So it's going to be a beauty shot, and I make it, they're going to enjoy it. So I get called on a lot of events, but I have a great staff. I have, I have family members here. A lot of these guys, it's because their family's there. Mm -hmm. And if it's not a younger son or daughter, it's the same guy who's there 50 years. Yeah. And that means a lot. And that's where people come to Arthur Avenue and they feel like, wow. And the other thing with Arthur Avenue is there's 10 places in a row. You walk out of the bakery, you walk out of the pasta shop, you walk, everything you leave, you go home, everything's great. And that's what's exciting. Sometimes you go shop in other areas, like my daughter's up in Boston. You could keep the cannoli, you could keep the pasta. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I want their little Italy to do well. It's cute. They have a lot of nice restaurants. We ate at a couple of restaurants. It was good, but it's not Little Italy like Arthur Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, even there, I noticed they have, they're paying people to sing. They're in the streets singing, which is beautiful. You felt like you were in a little neighborhood. Here, we don't do that as much as we should, mm -hmm. but the merchants are the ones that make this neighborhood. Oh, what's up, pal? How we doing, Baizan? This is a guy. It's a, it's a destination, Arthur Avenue, you know, like, it's, you don't have people singing in the streets because you're not relying on walk-by traffic. Like, oh, maybe we'll go get a plate of macaroni. You got people that are coming here from all over Westchester. All of, you know, people from Connecticut come down. People from Manhattan come up. So it's it's a destination. It's like a, it's like the you got to go through the looking glass. People that go to the Botanical Garden yeah. or the Bronx Zoo or Yankee Stadium, Yankee Stadium. In between those three. So the Bronx has three major facilities. Yankee Stadium is the biggest tourist attraction in New York. It's in the Bronx. Botanical Garden and the Zoo are right up there in the top five. Arthur Avenue is right there also. I feel like the Bronx gets made fun of a lot on social media. Oh, for, you oh, like to you make fun that? of the Bronx. I'll take care of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Them. Because they can't keep up with us. Hello. We have issues. Don't park your car around the corner. You're right. It's going to disappear. But they, I'll tell you what. I love my five boroughs. I go to Queens. I go to Brooklyn. I said, but you I... You go to Staten Island? I like Staten Italy. When I was young, I had a lot of leases in Staten Italy. No more Staten Italy, though. I'm, you gotta stay that's away. a long time ago. Well, the smell. I can't take the smell as soon as you hit that bridge. The dump. As soon as you hit the bridge. But we used to make a lot of trips to Staten Island. Yeah. We like... Uh, listen, I, I'll tell you the joke. Staten Italy, I was selling mozzarella to shop rights. One day, I had like four women, beautiful women, very expensive bags. We want to buy your mozzarella, but it's got to go on sale. It's $30 for the bridge to come over here. I'm not coming anymore. I stopped going to Staten Island. It's like a little they Italian town. They cry with the loaf of bread under yeah. their arm. Two loaves. <laughs> Two loaves. Two loaves. Two loaves. Piangio con la panna sotto la braccia. The problem with actually, the Bronx, uh, for me... Actually, go, go, go. No, I was going to say it very quick. The problem with the Bronx for me is the second I hear I have to go over the RFK, I'm thinking upstate. Uh, <laughs> so, no, I always tease. We're not the red-headed stepchildren in the Bronx. <laughs> All the boroughs, and that's what I love when cousins come in from the, I love for them to see all the boroughs. Brooklyn, they all want to live in Brooklyn. When they hear the prices, a little apartment, 3000 they have a heart attack. <laughs> then they start looking in Queens. And Queens is nice, too. It's just, when you're in the Bronx, there's something about the Bronx that's quaint. Yeah. Can you live here? Can you stay? It's, it's hard. But I think shopping-wise, the Bronx has a lot to offer. You know, yeah. I got to ask uh, Dave a tough question. That's only right. I'm ready. On the way here, we saw a store, pizza and burek, burak, burek, 
Yeah, Brek. We got a lot of shipped auto. We got a lot a of lot Albanian. So since, 19, since the early 70s, on our event last week, Anthony Mardita, that man's family cleaned this market in the early 70s. That's a professional at a high level, that young man. The Albanians came to Arthur Avenue because right now, if you go to Florence, Florence, there's a lot of Albanians running the businesses. Mm -hmm. And something interesting, the Italians get insulted, but when you ask them, oh, you're Albanian, if they were born in Italy, they're, they're Italian in their head. Their parents are Albanian, they're Albanian blood, but if they're, and they're very proud of Italy. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they go through Italy to come to America, but I have to tell you, a lot of our paisans make their first dollar, they buy their first house, they put their feet up. Yeah. The Albanians, I give them credit because they work so hard. They buy their first building, they live in the small apartment and rent the big one upstairs until they buy the big building with 100 apartments. Mm -hmm. And I seen, what I've seen in 35, 40 years over here, I give them a lot of kudos. And what they do, they keep their family unit together. Mm -hmm. But the, Their holidays, their saint days are very important to them. Where the Italians, oh, I don't like that cousin, I'm not gonna go. Hmm. Oh, that yeah. cousin's husband's an asshole. I'm not gonna have him over the house. The Albanians will just race for it. <laughs> Listen, they don't care. They don't like somebody who's got to come over, though. Yeah. But my question was gonna be, in the neighborhood, a lot, a lot of places, right? That like Albanians that have these pizzerias, or you go to a pizzeria and it's like people that aren't Italian, Italian American making pizza. Do you think that the food is still Italian if an Italian person? Or someone that's like not Italian the son is making it? Listen, that's every restaurant in New York City right now. So you got to take it from where it's coming from. Meaning, if it's an Italian owner and he has a, like I have a Venezuelan guy, a Mexican guy, the sandwich is made my way. Now, I buy the product, 70% is from Italy. Mm -hmm. So it, balance it out. If they're buying the same way and they're buying right, the biggest problem in America is who's buying it Restaurant Depot, which to me is the same thing as Home Depot. Yeah. So if you want to go buy your product at Home Depot, that's what you're going to get. It's a commercial. I love yeah. when somebody compares one of these warehouses, oh, filet mignon. You buy a piece of filet mignon from this guy, sear it, leave it almost raw and eat that. It's tender and delicious. You go buy it from one of these clubs. Yeah, it was half price. Was it healthy for you, number one? Mm -hmm. And what it tastes like? Shoe leather. My issue is you are what you eat. I always say it because you could, I don't care what nationality you are. If you're serving good quality and you were taught right, and a lot of them, like I said, on, on this neighborhood, I find that the group of Albanians that we have, we have a great group of people. We have an Albanian that bought a whole group of buildings on the end, and they set three different restaurants up, and they're all doing good. We have a cafe that opened up on the end. Prince is doing very well. So for me, I know Tony and Tina's Pizza. They make one of the best bareks around. They're living in the area. They're li Pelham Parkway, 50% Italian, 50% Albanian in the homes yeah. that are there. They come to the neighborhood. They enjoy it. And they love to, I have to tell you, they love to take care of their family. So their shopping is not like a lot of young Italian-Americans. Oh, no, I'm on a diet. Oh, I don't eat pasta. You know how many people here don't eat carbs anymore? That's how the Italians usually started. And growing up, my parents and no, no, always be like, mangia pasta, mangia pasta. Of course. Pasta. That's Seven like days a week. Yeah, yeah, it's your base. Seven days a week we had pasta. I could eat pasta every day. I actually do. <laughs> when I, I live with my dad in Colby, we eat every day. I try to have earlier, though. That's if smart. I want a dish of linguine, I have it at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. When I eat my carbs early, I'm good. Mm -hmm. That's the way to do it. But is the neighborhood changed? Yes. I think, for, on a positive note, the Fordham kids are rocking the neighborhood because kids 18 to 22 have been around the world right now. Most of them have mommy's credit card and daddy's <laughs> credit card. So they're very happy to shop, and the parents want them to eat good. Yeah. Do we have more Albanians than we had Italians at one time? Absolutely. Yeah, I see but that. But even in Italy. Yeah. You go to Italy right now, like I said, Florence is all run by Albanians. A lot of Italians, though, they want, like you, once you said, once they get the money, they go to the suburban area. So a lot of Bronx It's Italians. about the schools. I give them credit. They want their kids in better schools because mm -hmm. they don't want to pay for school. Westchester, too. Like, Westchester like, schools. Yeah. You pay for the school. You feel like you're... It's covered in the taxes, mm -hmm. and, you, that, and that's how it happens. You get to the suburbs to get your feet up. Again, the Albanians, I, 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 through my experience, I've witnessed them. They fight to buy the building. They'll rent the small, the bigger one out, and they'll get that bigger building. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've seen a lot of families, and I give them a lot of credit. What would you say is, like, the shopping list of your average customer here? What do they come here to get? So my, my customer, 
prosciutto di parma sliced really thin. We layer it with three or four slices, depending on how big it is, because you don't want it to stick. Our parmigiano is a three to four year old parmigiano. Our fresh mutz, and sometimes they get the scamozza or smoked mozzarella, like they'll mix it. Some people come every week for the same items. Um, mortadella, I have the big 100 kilo mortadella. 100 kilo? And we split it, because it's too big. It's a half moon shape. And sometimes you get somebody like, oh, why is it cut like that? When they taste it, they can't believe the flavor of it. Uh, you cut it in fours? I cut it in a uh, half. Half. Just oh, a half you moon. do it a long way. Because it's long, and then we split it and make a half moon. It's delicious. Wow. The this is an in industry conversation. Hot, yeah. hot bread, <laughs> this is a lot of deli experience hot I'm lacking. Bread with a slice of mortadella on it. It's so amazing. it's not Chitero? What, what brand is it? Chitero is very good. It's made in Pennsylvania, it's commercial to me. This is called Rovignate Mortadella. We'll get a slice after you. Yeah, I, I literally some. will tell you, it melts in your mouth. And the flavor, and you'll even see the salt content, is a lot less. It, to me, it, it's more expensive. So once in a while, we'll get the, the Queens guy. Oh, $16 a pound for mortadella. It's $8 in Queens. It's not. Not anymore. Uh, yeah, not well, anymore. Nothing is. <laughs> prices nothing are is. out of control. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prices are out of control. Being, if you're watching this episode, it's Easter. I don't know if you're watching Easter day or day after, maybe. Well, our Easter order's different. What are some Easter so traditions for you guys? people are making pizza rustica. Mm -hmm. They're coming in. Some have the sliced layering. Pizza rustica or pizza gain is the same thing, yeah. but they're different styles. Some layer it where the slices are thin and they layer. Mm -hmm. I don't care for that type. We do it a little chunky where it's prosciutto, julienne, sausage, dry sausage, julienne, and sopra salad julienne. What does that mean, julienne? So it's when it's a strip and then cut. Yeah. So it's a chunk. It's oh, not okay, little, okay. Yeah, not yeah. little little pieces. See, that's out like of our league. league. I don't know what Julian. Right? He's not your well, average <laughs> deli guy. <folks>. In <laughs> Salerno, you say from Salerno, Salerno yeah. and Avellino, they love antipasto where it's not thin. They make it chunks. Yeah. Like the calabrese too. Then they mix it. That's true. Basket cheese. There's two types of basket cheese. There's a fresh basket cheese with no salt. My grandmother used to call it formaggio del della melada. The sick people sick, cheese. Yeah. And she That's used true. to have a piece of that with tomato and whole wheat bread. And a lot of extra virgin oil and black pepper. That's where the flavor came from. That, that basket cheese is moist and no salt, so it absorbs the salt from the prosciutto. Then the other basket cheese is like a dry scamozza, and it melts. Then you add ricotta and fresh pecorino cheese. Salt. Something about the aroma, and when it cooks down, it's amazing. It takes two and a half hours to cook a pizza rustica, but it's amazing. Yeah, it's so good. Do you still sell out pizza rustica? Not like we used to. We used to start the month before. People were buying and giving us gifts. Next week, the, this week, we'll have a, a big hit Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I find more people are coming just to consume it on the spot. They love to buy a piece. Free piece? I think of free. We were looking for some slices of mortadella and that prosciutto. Oh, yeah. Our stomachs are ground. Great. The rovignati mortadella and a few slices. By the, the way, the, the girls you have working here, every time we come, they're so on point. Yeah, we good. try. They're Last time, seven espressos. So, <laughs> imagine Anna is here 20 years. Yeah. Oh, wow. She was pregnant to her son working for us outside. Wow. And Brie was a little girl, and she used to say, I'm going to run this place. <laughs> and she really, really does that. Yep. yep. Again, that's passion. They really care about the job. They enjoy it. And it, that's part, if you make your work fun, Mark Twain said, make your advocation a vacation. We're not on vacation, but we like to have fun. Whoa. So uh, this so, is just a little burrata. That was so quick. Oh, yeah, <laughs> a little burrata. Wow. Are you expecting more people? <laughs> the big, the big one. This is just picking. We're just picking. Just pick this, is, this is why I love this. this David's I can't, I can't foods. focus anymore. These are like no. some of our main... Uh, we make the burrata, and then we top it. This is... It's not prosciutto. It's speck. It's so, grilled, no? Or so fried? We, we crisp the speck, and then when you crisp the speck... Thank you. That ain't no, ba salt, that ain't no bacon bit. The no. salt comes out. That ain't no bacon, my baby. You still hooked on New Orleans. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> my baby. So... Like, like New Orleans, I feel like over here, our neighborhood, you all see people coming in. They don't live in the neighborhood. They come here, and whether their grandmother did or their grandfather, they have a passion for the neighborhood because they feel like they were part of the neighborhood. This week I talked with Chaz. Chaz was concerned about the neighborhood. Want to make sure things... He's a rock star. He's a, he's a legit A-lister. He cares about this neighborhood because he was born and raised for the neighborhood. And that's a beautiful thing. And he's still doing his show. Dion, too. Dion, I was the next person I was going to mention. 
Dion's living in Manhattan, but he loves the neighborhood. And like Louis Prima, Dion's all Louis Prima. Yeah. Because, let's face it, he is truly in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He's amazing, and he did his songs. He was on the corner of 187, right in front of the church. That's why right they're now. the Belmonts, yeah. right? I mean, It's an amazing story, and, it, yeah. and it's nice to see. So people come from all over this week. Easter week is pretty special. And I, I think we're going to have a nice time. I think a lot of people will be coming out. I think for the delis, uh, with the pizza rooster, and even people that want to make their own stuff, they get everything here. What are you what guys What are you looking put? for, my man? I want to help you. Oh, okay. Luigi? You look like you know where Luigi is. <laughs> On the end. On the end. Thank you, brother. Oh, no. Uber yeah. Eats. Oh, Uber Eats in Starbucks yeah. is amazing. Where's Mario, though? Yeah, but it's not for me. It's for me. You got Luigi. You, you look like an Uber Eats guy. Oh, there you go. You look like an Uber Eats guy. Yeah, yeah, just me. <laughs> what, what do you guys put in your meat pie? Uh, your families. There's. Our family's right, there's been making sausage. The, the pizza rustica style, though, with the dough. Yeah. Because there's the ones with the, right? Like the. There's the pizza grana. Pizza guina. Yeah. And I feel like Pat would be going crazy. Pat oh, would yes. be having a heart so attack. So it's chunks of mortadella, chunks of cured sausage, uh, chunks of prosciutto, but not like the. The rich, yeah. soft prosciutto, the, yeah, the yeah, harder yeah. part of the prosciutto. Yeah, like show them the mortadella, one. Dave. Show, show them a slice. This is the mortadella, Robignac. Right that's, there. That's a half moon piece. This, you can see through it. Wow. <sighs> smell it, though. Yeah, you can't smell it. That smells it. what mortadella is. You think you can read the newspaper like, through this or no? You probably manja, manja. could. I love my job, man. So, thank you. <laughs> Mama, I made it. <laughs> I get paid to eat mortadella. Look at this. Who's better than us? The best. I, I wonder. Andrew. I wonder when my nana and nono came to this country, they said, our grandchildren are being mortadella and make money doing it. <laughs> That's the American wait, dream. Now, that is the Italian what American dream. What is the flavor dream. that Is it no salt? It's insane. Yeah, it's delicious. The fat on it is amazing. Wow. And that's what makes mortadella so special. I'm not a mortadella guy, but that's probably the best mortadella. Oh, so I yeah, love man. mortadella. A lot of people will say, oh, I don't want mortadella on the combo. Why not? I don't like mortadella. Signora Mangia, Signora Mangia. How many marons is it? They taste that. And they say, wow, that's good. Good. That's that's delicious. Delicious. She doesn't want to pay the $16.99. She went men's a man. <laughs> no, it's ice. delicious. It's an ice. Never, it's an let, ice. never let anybody know. <laughs> I like. <laughs> Well, oh, you know, great. if you say, like, if a customer, especially the old school customers, if they say something's good, they know you're going to whack them. Yeah. So they always go, eh, okay. Nah, we don't whack anybody over here. It's a negotiation area, constantly. <laughs> it's all right. That's what it's about. It's about family. You got People cash come discounts here? here or no? Of course. <laughs> you want to laugh at cash? 4% less. 4 he, less. He and I were in New Orleans one time for the weekend, and we went to the casino. I think we won a little bit, and I went to the cage to get my cash out. And the guy, I had an old $100 bill from, like, when we were kids. I said, you know what? I'm going to save this. He says, why are you saving? I go, oh, you know, I haven't seen one in a while. He goes, you want old hundreds? Come by my place. Everybody we have takes a field them trip over under here. the Look mattress. This. Oh, wow. We do. What's up, guys? Tom, you're right. Hey, David. Nice you brought this class. Sorry, this gentleman comes all the time out of his we way. We have our friends from San Francisco here. These guys first time, but the teachers in the back know you Hi, guys. guys how wow. are you? San Fran. Make sure to get the mortadella, guys, all right? Yeah, that's Say hello to the camera, too, guys. This way you're going to be on this show. You got to smile. You're from San Francisco. You're in New York. Aren't you happy? And it's Patricia. Hello, Patricia. How are you? Pleasure, brother. Yes, I'm glad you guys came back. Yes. You guys are very lucky. A lot of teachers wouldn't take a trip like this. Um, for a podcast. Okay. Yeah. Shooting for a podcast. Say hello to Dave when you come by. This Hi, guys. Is Thank you for coming. Make sure they get you a sample. Go swing around, I'll have them have samples for them. So how's things in San Francisco, guys? How do you like New York? It's very cool. It's definitely like cool. That. You said that. Because New York is cool. San Francisco is beautiful. But New York is cool. Make sure you guys eat your way through New York. All right. Enjoy it. I got to appreciate that Tom brings you guys around. Thank you very much for coming, guys. Check out our website and our TikTok, guys. Mike's oh, TikTok. That's Avenue right. Is our TikTok. Yeah, you'll see Mike's Mike's Daily That's how you know things are changing. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure to check out our That's TikTok. Start, they all yeah. pepped up. Yeah. Make sure to check out our TikTok too while we're on the subject. We're, we're doing a podcast. Mike's Growing Daily up Italian. <laughs> Growing up Italian. <laughs> Any Italian Mike's Italian? Deli, Arthur yeah. Avenue. Italian? Sabino <laughs> Curcio, all that stuff. <laughs> Any Italian? Then, no. This is Growing Up Italian. You Every follower Italian. counts. Yep. <laughs> this is our demographic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> 
You San guys Fran. swing around. Shell shock sample. Get Brianna, get the kids. They have provolone cut and sausage. We'll wrap it. You guys yeah. swing around, and Brianna will have some samples of salami and cheese for you guys. Is there anything else? Uh, we, guys, we is there anything else? Right, anything else you want to say before we go? No, I just want to say thank you for the hospitality, oh, New guys, Orleans. It was my honor to have John. You it's been amazing. Thank you for having us there. Are you me? What that a trip a that was. Put no. the macaroni on. We're coming home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy you guys made it. <laughs> yeah, manj, manj, have some burrata.